Welcome back to the Northern Sentinels podcast. I'm your host, Chris Ayotte. On this episode, Karen McCrimmon and I sit down in her provincial MPP office to discuss her journey of service. Karen grew up in communities across Ontario, like Toronto, Timmins, and Windsor, and was active in both cadets and the Army Reserves during her youth. After completing her undergraduate degree at the University of Windsor, she enrolled in the Canadian Armed Forces and was the first woman to qualify as an air navigator. She spent most of her career in air operations and hung up her flight suit after 26 years. However, her retirement didn't last long and she decided to continue to serve via politics, first as a federal MP and then as a provincial MPP. Her road to the House of Commons started through local volunteering and grew to a point where she ran to be the leader of the federal Liberal Party. There is no doubt Karen is passionate about service and taking care of her fellow citizens. Before we get to our guest, a word from our partner for this episode, Can Praxis, a veteran charity. Our veterans and first responders work tirelessly to help keep us safe. There's often a price to pay with that work, though, and sometimes that price is an occupational stress injury, such as PTSD. These injuries affect the whole family, which is why Can Praxis offers equine assisted therapy to help those families heal and thrive. Programs are offered at no cost to veteran or first responder families. But to do so, we need your support. To find out how you can help, visit canpraxis.com ways to support listeners here's my conversation with karen mccrimmon karen uh, thanks so much for hosting the uh, the podcast in your office today and uh, and taking the time i know you're always really busy so it's uh, it's appreciated to be able to sit down and have a little bit of time with you today it's my absolute pleasure, Chris. As I was driving over, and uh, I, someone who's been as busy as you have been for so long, I mean, do, do you have a morning routine as a touchstone? I guess I do. I think I start to st- try to start every day with an opportunity just to, to kind of breathe and kind of uh, think about what the day can bring, or what the potential for the day is. I need to exercise. Uh, I, I am not happy if I don't get exercise in. I have to start every day that way. And um, But in this world, I find that I, I can't be a slave to a routine. Sometimes my morning kind of opportunity to center and just kind of uh, prepare for the day, sometimes I can give it, you know, an hour. And some days I can give it 10 minutes. And I can't, I can't be a slave to it. I just, but I just recognize I need time in order to, to, I think, be able to serve people the way I want to serve them and to be totally present for them when I'm with them. I have to do it for myself first. And yeah. I have to take that little bit of time for me. And then if I do that, then I have lots of energy to give away to everybody else. So you you have to be a little bit selfish and I have to do it first thing in the morning because if I don't do it first thing in the morning, it won't happen. And then my day won't end up going the way I want it to go. So that's. Yeah, it's uh, I, there's a there's a uh, retired uh, U.S. general named Paul Funk and, and I got introduced to him, uh, his Funkisms when I was uh, when I was deployed and these have grown throughout his career. I think, I think people can look them up online and I'll, I'll put a link in the show notes, but his first one is secure yourself first. Mm. And I think he's got sort of 40 or 50 of these sort of words of wisdom in there and they're kind of neat, but uh, yeah, I couldn't agree more. I had a, a day this week where I didn't get to do that in the morning. And by the end of the day, I could feel it. Mm-hmm. It was a, it was a material difference without a doubt. Um, now, why don't we start off talking about family? I always like to uh, to do that with with guests. And where's your uh, where's your father from? Where's the father your father's side of the family from? New Brunswick, New Brunswick, down near Chatham, New Brunswick. And uh, so, and and they had a large family, and I think they had been in New Brunswick for, and it's kind of half Irish, half French. Okay. Yeah. And what uh, what did the family do in, in Chatham? What was the family business? 
um, he was a firefighter, actually. My father's father was a, a firefighter. Okay. So, um, and uh, then, um, so that family kind of, uh, as time went on, they all left. No, nobody stayed. They, okay. they all left and uh, went on to, to, to bigger things. And uh, but it was hard in that the family was scattered all over the place, you know, so... It was, uh, we didn't get to see them at all. I saw my mother was from Scotland and I saw my mother's family more than I saw my father's family. So just by the nature, I think they they weren't close. It wasn't something uh, uh, that they really practiced was bringing the family together. And my mother's family was exactly the opposite. Right. Yeah. And what, so what, pulled your father away from Chatham. You said everybody left. What was the... I think opportunity. And um, he was a smart man. And uh, he knew that he wasn't going to be able to get the kind of job he wanted. And and you have to give him credit. I mean, he had high school and I think one year of college, one year of trade school, technical school. And then he went to Toronto and he got a job working with uh, Avro on the Avro Arrow in the metallurgy shop. So here is this, uh, you know, he, was, he made it through high school and he went to Avro and, and really loved uh, working on the Avro Arrow. And to, to, to the day he died, whenever he would talk about that, there would be tears in his eyes. He, it was just something that mattered to him. So, and he passed that on to, to us. So, and then when they, when, they shut the program down. My mother said that was the hardest time in her whole life when my father was out of work and could not find work. And um, it, she said it was tough and she didn't have an easy life. Mm-hmm. She had a tough life. But, and he couldn't find a job. He couldn't even find a job selling soup with Campbell Soup Company. Now, that's the story they tell. But he eventually got a job with Trans Canada Airlines in Timmins, Ontario. Right. So we had to move the family from Toronto, Georgetown, to Timmins. Now, I mean, uh, I think the story of, of the Avro Arrow might have been lost a little bit in uh, over the years. Um, you know, can you give the listener a bit of a sense of uh, of the significance of uh, of the Avro Arrow? It was just so ahead of its time in so many ways. It's, technological leaps and bounds. So this was an aircraft it was designed a, by... A fighter jet designed by Canadians, built by Canadians, and just with so many technological advances, everything from metallurgy and materials to um, uh, flight controls and uh, power plants and engines and stuff, it, totally uh, Canadian and way ahead of its time. And so, but it was, it was costing money. You had to be honest. It was costing money. Um, But here's what, this is what I've told, I've been told has happened. When they shut the Avro program down, half the engineers went to NASA in the States. That's the kind of quality of people were leading this program. And they're the people that worked and and got the man on the moon and finished all that, you know, the Apollo project. So it was it was a, a Canadian project program that really was way ahead of its ahead of itself. So yeah, I think there's a, there, there's a number of conspiracy theories you can always dig up on it as well. But I, sure. I, I think the what you highlighted is is really important that there's a lot of talent. And there always has oh, been a lot of yes. talent in Canada, uh, and mm-hmm. and that's just a, a great historical example. And I'll again, I'll link that in the show notes so people want to know more about it because I think it's an important. It's an important example we can actually use today as well as uh, so much talent that we have in, in this country. I agree. And, and I think that's, that's a point that Canadians I th- sometimes fail to understand. It is by virtue of a, a world-class education system and a world-class higher education system. But it's also by virtue of the Canadian culture. And what I think that the dominant things in Canadian culture is collaboration. I don't have to own it all and I don't have to be rich. 
but being part of a team that can make a difference, I think that's what drives Canadians. They, they are entrepreneurs. They are innovators. And because our climate kind of demands it of us, that kind of teamwork in order to survive, it's part of our culture. And then you bring in that talent and that open-mindedness not closed-minded, very open-minded, open to the world, open to possibilities. And I think that's what makes us, brings us so much uh, potential in terms of innovation and doing new things and looking at things differently. So I may think the Avra era was a perfect example of that. Yeah. Now, in terms of your, your mother's side of the family, you said that she immigrated from Scotland. Um, I mean, what was her life like in Scotland uh, growing up? She was, they were a very poor family. And that's why both the brother and sister left as soon as they could. And um, my mother tells me stories about getting Red Cross shoes because she couldn't afford, they, the family couldn't afford to buy shoes. So they would get their shoes from the Red Cross. But everybody knew they were Red Cross shoes. Only poor people wore Red Something Cross Something distinctive shoes. about them? Oh, yeah. Right. Yes. And so being in a, in a, a, a poor family, and um, so she, you know, she, I think it was hard. Uh, I think uh, most of my relatives um, on the, on the, on the, on the women's side, they were all, they were called kippers, kipperers. They're the women that would gut and prepare mackerel to smoke and salt and, and preserve. They didn't get paid very much. Life was really, really hard. And so my mother, she was always saving. She, she, never, she never expected her good fortune. And when she came to Canada and, and the kind of life she was able to build here for herself and especially for her children... She always expected it to disappear. She never had confidence that this was going to last. So she saved everything. And, and she was always making, uh, saving money. And when we grew up and lived in Timmins, we would go in and um, pick blueberries. And then she'd make blueberry pies during, and, and sell them. She would knit. She would sew. She would do anything to make a little a bit extra money. We never got store-bought clothes. They were hand-me-downs from other people. And then she would make them special for us, mm. take them in, make them fit us. So she was always saving money. And that uh, I think that kind of rubbed off on me a little bit. Maybe not as extreme as my mother, but um, it is about preserving what you have and not overspending and living within your budget. And, and that was uh, one thing she tried to teach all of us. And I think that was important. So coming from that kind of poverty, there was always that fear, I think was always there. You, you described her to me before in our, our sort of sit down previously as a natural caregiver, oh, which gotcha. I think is, is fascinating and that you've, uh, and, and not uncommon that a lot of people describe um, people who come from impoverished backgrounds as being the most generous. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, it sounds like you, that your mother was that way as well. No, it's absolutely true. You you go and look. Go look at chari charitable givings across this country. Go find out the provinces that give the most to charity. It's those that have the least. And so I think... And, and she also said, you're all in this together. You've been blessed, Karen. You've been given so many blessings. It's your job to share those blessings and make sure other people have a chance too. So very instrumental and in the idea of looking after people. Our house was always crazy with people. Whenever my dad wasn't home. <laughs> right. <okay? laughs> and... Uh, Everybody knew they, they could count her and, and she would be there. If anybody needed anything, she'd be there, you know, even in some pretty tough situations. She always stepped up to be the one who could, who could help and make the difference. Was that something that she learned from, uh, from her childhood or is it just something from that was her, natural in her? From her grandmother. Okay. Her grandmother was called Mither 
And she was the same. That okay. her, but her mother was totally different, the opposite end of the scale. Okay. And then my mother took after her grandmother, who was uh, the same. So, yeah, and, uh, you know, the, there were war years. There was times where, where there were orphan children and people who didn't have a place. She would, she would look after everybody. And so I think that's, my mother got that example from her grandmother. Mm, okay. And, and you, you mentioned after your uh, Avro was shut down uh, and your father got work in Timmins. So um, was that sort of where you spent some of your formative years? Yeah, yeah I would say uh, my elementary, elementary school years were in Timmins and it was a great place to grow up. It was a great place to grow up because it was safe and uh, there was always things, to, uh, always new adventures. And I, I remember my mom saying, come home when the street lights come on. You know, yep. kick you out of the house. If you want to take a lunch, here's a lunch and an apple and we'll, we'll see you later. And we would, and we had all kinds of fields and hills and, you know, we would eventually, we would get a bike and off we would go, go fishing. We go fishing, we go hunting, we go, you know, off with our bikes adventuring. So it really was a uh, a great place to grow up in and uh, gave me a sense of, I think, a sense of adventure and individual competence, I think, because I wasn't, I had, I went out and learned from my brothers and learned from my friends, uh, you know, how to, how to do a lot of things, how to, how to braid willow whips and how to set snares and how to, you know, a little bit of everything. So I think that freedom that I enjoyed as a child in, in Timmins really helped build the person that I am today. And what precipitated the move down to, I think it was Windsor. It was Windsor. Windsor. So how did that come about then having to leave uh, Timmins and and what was that transition from a, a, a more northern community to a very oh. not northern community? It uh, It was a promotion for my dad. Okay. Right. And, um, and so he, I think he, he ended up being the airport manager in Windsor. So that was a big promotion because he started out just being, uh, being a baggage handler, right. And to move from baggage handler and then a station attendant and then a senior attendant. And then he got the job managing the Windsor airport for Air Canada at the time. So, um, it was, but, you know, and so my mom is, I don't think she was particularly attached to Timmins. It was hard in the winter time. It was a tough place in the winter, but you know, her kids were all doing well and happy. And so I think she, but then we moved from Timmins to Windsor in 1970 after the 60, like 69, 70, after the race riots in Detroit and all the violence that happened in Detroit, she was just terrified. Okay. Just terrified. And she didn't know, you know, what she, I remember she tell, told me much later, she said, I thought, what am I doing to my children? Where am I bringing my children? What are they going to face, you know? And so she was really afraid when we moved to Windsor, but she actually learned to love it. Learned to love it after, after the... All the, the the challenges with, um, you know, the race riots and, and the, the disadvantages in Detroit and the Vietnam War and the protests and all that, after that kind of settled down, then, then uh, it really was a, a, a good place and she, she loved it. So um, it, that's, I went to high school and university in Windsor. So, and it, uh, it, it was a, a good place to be. And, um, again, and that's where I ended up, you know, getting involved in the military for the first time. Right. It's, it's, I mean, I think we'll, we'll, we'll dive obviously into your military career. I just, I was thinking that so you're talking about your, uh, Avro shuts down. So your father leaves New Brunswick for opportunities, goes to Timmins after Avro and then goes down to Windsor. I mean, it seems like. I don't think this is an uncommon theme of the past is that people went where the work was. Mm. And I don't know, do you see that as much uh, anymore? This is a bit of a tangent, but I was, it just sort of popped into my mind. I'm, I don't know how much people go to the work uh, as much as they maybe used to. I, th well, they, I think the government has, and, and the government of maritime provinces really, um, 
you know, with the shutdown of the shipyards and things like that that happened after World War II, there was definitely a, a loss of opportunity. But they've since, I think, made significant investments to create those new opportunities, you know, so that maybe people didn't have to leave home in order to have a good job. I think it still happens. Um, if you look at the people that go and work in the oil fields out right. in, out in Alberta, yeah, that's very uh, true. Searching for uh, that kind of an opportunity, but I think we've done a better job at at creating opportunities closer to home for people, so they they didn't have to leave. Which is, I mean, which is great. I mean, you get that that sense of community. I mean, my my wife is from a community in British Columbia. Um, where industry brought people from uh, all over the, well, not just all over the country, but all over the world, Alcan uh, Aluminum. And it was one of, came out, was one of the most diverse uh, towns in, in the country. They had everybody from, you know, from Finland, from Italy, uh, from Greece, uh, Portugal, you, you name it, all were brought in to start this smelter and then the energy sort of generator, uh, Eurocan, next to it. So yeah, I just, as you were talking about that, I thought, yeah, we've, we have done a much better job of sort of providing those opportunities closer to home, which is great. Back to sort of life in Windsor, uh, as you said, you know, your, your start of your military career, as you, you told me, and I, I don't think I got the story from you about how, what the mm-hmm. dare was that got you to join cadets as your first uh, uniformed uh, exposure. Yeah, well, that was my older brother, Brian. So... And um, he and my younger brother, Terry, they had both joined the Windsor Regiment, so which was the local reserve unit. Right, the Army Reserve Unit. The Army Reserve Unit. And uh, they had heard that there was uh, an opportunity, there was a cadet corps near where I lived. And um, so, you know, I was talking to them about what they were doing, and, and they were just... Oh, you know, this this isn't for girls. You know, this is this is for for boy for us for men have to do this and and um, yeah, you can't join cadets because you'd have to fire. A, uh, I said I can fire a gun. I know how to fire a gun. You know, I learned how to do that and and um, so I was really I was just uh, being stubborn. And he says, "Well, then, well, go join cadets." I dare you. There's just no, there's no way the girls don't belong there and, and you wouldn't do it anyway. You're too much of a sissy and uh, okay, well, I'll show you, right? It's typical. Well, they were stoking the fire, clearly. (laughs) Exactly. So, and, and I did, and I went and joined the cadet corps and it was the best, one of the best moves I've ever made. I learned a lot. I learned about me. I it, it brought me, and I fit in. I probably fit in better than my brothers did. And I, I don't. It's interesting in that um, uh, because I think I was the girl, the, the oldest girl in the family. I was used to actually doing what I was told and taking orders and doing, you know, doing crap jobs and so and. Um, being responsible and they were a little bit spoiled so <laughs> yeah when i joined the military doing doing the tough work doing the things you didn't want to do having self discipline and stuff it, it came natural to me so i actually ended up making a career of it and so cadets was very successful for me i had i had lovely role models lovely role models in cadets about how to take care of people and the respond and that's where i started to learn about leadership watching people and liking the way someone treated someone oh, that's how they got that done okay why they talk to them that way how you know and and feeling people that who who actually reached out to me and and i i appreciated it and it made me feel good and gave me confidence that i could do this and then i learned that I could do that for other people. Someone did it for me and I can turn around and now I can do it for other people. That was a big aha moment for me when I realized that I have been given a gift and now I can take that gift and I can give it to other people. And then you, so you were in cadets 
And, and if I recall, you then uh, joined the, the Army Reserve Unit when you went to university. That's right. Exactly. And when I kind of aged out of cadets and aged into the into the reserve unit. And it, too, was a, a great experience. And um, there were lots of good examples and lots of bad examples. But yeah. I would say, I would say honestly, that there were more good examples there in that because if you weren't a good leader, all of those people that were members of that unit were there because they wanted to. The, you, there was no coercion involved other than some people needed the money. Okay. But the vast majority of people were there because they wanted to be there. They wanted to do something. But if you didn't treat them right, if you didn't lead them correctly, then they would just leave. And for a, a while in the reserve unit, we had tremendous turnover. And that was because of the leadership. And then for the leadership changed. And then we didn't have that problem anymore. And I'm kind of watching what's going on. And you, more and more, I understand the impact that leadership has on, has on people's everyday lives. And so I thought, well, this is, and that's how I paid my way through university was being in this reserve unit. But what a learning experience and what an opportunity. It was what, great. I would recommend it to anybody. What about, um, I mean, the, the subject of leadership, I think, is something that fascinates, uh, you know, anybody who's been in leadership roles. But what what was that pull or what did you really enjoy about leadership? Because clearly this oh. has been, if there was themes of your life, that would be one of your themes. Oh, for sure. For sure. Well, because I think with, with leadership, it, it's, a, it's a force multiplier, right? It is something where you can do even more good for people if you have a team of people that are, that are working together to achieve something. And um, there were, were times when, um, and it, it kind of drove me, uh, my expectations of what leaders were, and, you know, I'll uh, my my favorite quote is is John Quincy Adams with leadership. If by your actions, his definite. If by your actions, you inspire others to dream more, to learn more, to do more, and become more, then you are a leader. That's my favorite definition, and I've seen lots of them. And I think that's the i that's the key. The word is inspire. Do you inspire? people to serve more to do more for other people to be better people that's the kind of leadership i wanted to see and i knew that that there were examples of, of people doing ex exactly that and i thought i can do that so and that's what inspired me to keep going and and uh, ultimately to get involved in politics as you went through the the cadet program and then into the army reserves did you see yourself continuing on a, into the next step into the the full time full time service with the Canadian Armed Forces? Was that something you went? Yep, that's my path. No, <laughs> 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 no. I still felt as I still felt at the you know even after all of that, even after I had proven myself, I still felt like a bit of an outsider. Um, I I knew I could do it and do it well. And uh, really, um, after I finished my degree, my degree was in Russian and linguistics, of all things. And I really wanted to travel and kind of see the world. And, and I thought that the skills, the things that I had learned uh, would uh, a suit kind of like a foreign service kind of thing and I thought I can do that and I could enjoy that and um, I have I can bring talents to that and uh, so that's kind of where I was leaning um, which made my mother very happy my, my mother was not happy seeing me going off to work in a uniform every day and and um, especially when it ended up being kind of like a combat uniform and stuff like that it made her very nervous and um so, and I thought, well, you know, let me, let, I'm going to go and try this. And so what I did, I did take the foreign service exams and um, I, I did well enough. And uh, then right afterwards, um, this would have been in 1980, 
80, I guess. Um, we laid off a whole series of foreign service officers. And it, and that was a time, you know, remember back in the late 70s, early 80s, uh, the economy was struggling at that time as, as well. And uh, and so I thought, OK. And then they opened they opened flying trades for women. And remember, my dad worked for Air Canada. So I was around airplanes all the time, loved airplanes. And because my dad worked for Air Canada, we would go, we went to Scotland every summer to see my family. What a huge advantage that was. And I thought, well, I could do that too. Why not? I had not had anything to do with flying other than watching the airplanes fly overhead. But I thought, well, this is, this is worth a try. Maybe this is, I'm one of these people that say doors come along, try not to shut them. Right. Yeah. Trying. If a door comes along, you know, there's some doors you should shut, I suppose. <laughs> but uh, try and uh, think of there's a reason why that door opened. Go and give it a go. And so I knew I was happy in the military. I, I knew I could function. I knew I could do well. I could excel. Um, but I hadn't seen a, a job I really wanted to do until aviation jobs opened for women. And then it was um, I thought, OK. This is worth a try. This is brand new, brand new out there, and they're going to let women fly. So I thought, okay, I'm I'm going to go and give this a try. How was this? How was this rolled out? Do you remember? I mean, obviously, t- today's day and age, it'd be social media marketing, and it would be splashed over all sorts of media. But how how back then does this get communicated? And is there energy behind it? As this is a great thing, or is it just we're doing this thing? No, this was this was one of my regular support staff office officers who was helping the reserve unit. Said, handed me a pamphlet and okay. said, "You'd be really good at this." Yeah. One okay. one person. One person. Yes. I would not have found out about it otherwise. That is not an uncommon story of people that uh, have been on the podcast, Karen, of saying this person, mm-hmm. you know, made this, made me aware of this mm-hmm. or, you know, gave me a nudge. I mean, that's really, uh, yeah, it's, it's interesting how life can really could take a different path if it was not for one person. Oh, for sure. Yeah, uh, like that. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, what did your mom think? Because your mom, you said your mom had already got some, was not overly excited about <laughs> you you in a, in a uniform going to the militia. How did she feel about full-time service? Um, she was a little bit nervous. She was not sure I was going to be treated well. And uh, that uh, and that made her nervous. But she also knew that after my five years in the, in the Army Reserve that she knew I could take care of myself. So, she, you know, she said, just you be true to yourself. Don't you, you do what you think is right. And uh, I trust your judgment. And, uh, you know, you'll, you'll be able to do this and you'll do good things for people. When I joined and then I went and, uh, you know, I did the, I did the, um, the aptitude testing pilot navigator, and I came out higher as navigator than I did on as pilot, and they needed navigators. So I, I went the navigator way, and then when I graduated from nav school, um, my mom and dad came out, and they were just so proud of me. They were just so proud, you know. So, um, and of course, it was in the local newspaper and all that of first women, first woman navigator and stuff like that. And so... It, she she was really happy for me because she knew that I was happy doing what I was doing. So, and I think she thought, okay, she's happy doing it, then that, that's what matters. Uh, I want you to be happy. So go go do whatever makes you happy. Mm. So how, how did your um your background in the the then cadets and then the primary reserve, how did that is that a good foundation for uh, your service? A full-time service? Uh, yes, absolutely it was. It's funny because I recall going, maybe not in my basic officer training, in that I knew how to do all these things. I know how to strip and clean a, a weapon, and I knew how to map read, and I knew how to do all these things. So I was always helping people who who didn't know how to do things. And 
I've been this way for my whole life. I will say, I've gotten better. Sometimes I say it more nicer now than I did when I was younger. (laughs) But I will always say when I think there's something wrong, this isn't the right way to treat people. This is not the way we should be doing this. This is harmful. And so there was a couple of times in my basic officer training that I had to stand up for people and say that what was going on was dangerous or it was harmful and things needed to change. Well, I didn't ingratiate myself with it, with my um, my staff. Right. So, but anyway, I get, I just followed my mother's example and her, her advice and I just did what I thought was right and tried to look after people. So by the end of basic officer training, you know, you all, you, you get awarded who's the first to best and who gets to be the commander. And all that. Well, I didn't get any of those appointments. But at that time, they did a peer review. And I came out number one on peer review. But I didn't get recognized at all mm. otherwise. And I thought, I can live with that. Yeah. Okay, I'm good. I can do with that. And uh, so, yes, it's sure, everything I learned as a cadet, then everything I learned in the reserves, uh, both good examples and bad examples, it, it, it really did set me up for success. And when you look back on your, on your military career, I mean, what are some of the, the highlights? I mean, I think you'd noted previously about your time as a, uh, as a commanding officer, oh, as yeah. a squadron commander, and, yeah. and how much you, you enjoyed that. And what did you... What about that really stood out as being one of the highlights? I think because being a commanding officer at that at that level, you are all you are tightly connected with your team, right? And you can do a lot to help your team and to help get a mission done and set an example, but you can look after them. You can do a good job looking after them. And uh, and I I'm one of these people who believes that if you look after the team, the team will look after the mission. And uh, that made me really proud. I mean, we had the busiest flying squadron that there was during the time when I was the CO, and people were happy. And because, and I really wanted to set an example. How to, I did want to be a squadron commander. I really did, because I wanted to set an example of how it could be done differently. I didn't like the examples I had seen when I first joined the Air Force. It was all about the senior officers looking after themselves, taking all the best trips, doing not doing any of the dog work, not doing any of the weekend work, not working any holidays, uh, taking all the, mon- the trips where you can make money and doing that kind of stuff. And yet, and I thought, no, no, that's just not the way you do it. You have to be better than your people. You have to work harder than your people. You have to um, be there and to support your people so that they can do the best job that they can do. And so I thought, I always thought that that's the way you should do things. Looking after people and, and, and valuing people and supporting people, that's how you'll help grow good people. And you'll get the mission done in, in, a, in a great way. So um, that's why I think being a CEO, because I was, you were so tightly connected with everyone. I think the higher you get on the, um, on the ladder, it's harder to retain that, that connection. That connection gets tougher because right. there's more and more people. But at the CEO level, it was, it was as pure as it gets. I'd be remiss if we didn't, uh, didn't at least ask you about uh, the... Uh, which squadron you were the, the commanding officer of and what their mission was, because I think that that's, uh, that's important to recognize that team. Yeah, 429 was a tactical transport squadron flying C-130 Hercules, and we did a lot of, we did a lot of work, actually, uh, tactical airlift parachute delivery. Uh, we worked a lot with the people with the Airborne in Petawawa, and um, we did a lot of uh, first response missions, um, when Canada had to go somewhere dangerous on the other side of the world. We did a lot of humanitarian missions into some crazy places. So the work was probably the best work you could possibly hope for. But we were busy. We were really busy. And uh, 
it's um that's and i think that's uh, what you want i mean you want people who are challenged and, and yet rewarded and supported at the same time and if you do that people will step up and do what needs to get done yeah that sense of purpose i mean mm. it's uh, it's so powerful uh and you know if you've got a sense of purpose and you're busy and you've got that good leadership i mean it's it would be tough to find a better environment to, to flourish and to thrive in. We talked earlier as well about your time in Afghanistan. Was that your your sort of first experience on that uh, in an overseas environment like that? Yeah, for any for any extended period of time. Okay, we would hop in and hop out. Right, right. You know, we would fly in, drop a load, and in split or we would drop a load in Zagreb or we'd drop a load like in other places like uh, Skopje and in Albania we'd, and come out Haiti and come out to live. We were always in and out but for being somewhere for an extended period of time yeah that was my first longer deployment being part of that team and what a privilege that was absolute privilege and I was working for General Rick Hillier when I was in Afghanistan and it was um, it was the same thing. It was a team of, of just absolutely remarkable people. And uh, but this same team of people here we are, twenty years later, twenty years mm. later, and they're still getting together. It's a power of a shared experience. Uh, no, absolutely, and a shared commitment to each other. We all knew that no matter who was du- what duty, what you were on that day, what was happening, somebody else needed a hand with something. I wasn't experienced in half the stuff I could uh, that I ended up helping with. I didn't, but th- you need a hand. I've got a hand, mm-hmm. like you know. And when I had questions that things like when I'm doing mission planning. And that was part of my job in in Afghanistan. And I needed to understand what the the ground situation where before I sent an airplane in something, people always took the time. Come on, you know, help say this is where I think this is where the risks are. This is where the threats are. Here's one area that's a bit even the regular briefings. But they always, when I went and talked to them, they, they always had time to sit down and answer my questions. Nobody ever said, well, you should have listened to the briefing this morning. No. I said, okay, this is where we are. This is what's happening. And they always took the time. And even they did work that wasn't really in, in their bailiwick, but they knew it was part of the mission and it needed to get done. So everybody just went above and beyond for that whole team. It was remarkable. What were your impressions of, of Kabul? You know, it broke my heart. I tell you what it did. It convinced me how lucky I am to live here, especially as a woman. But it also made me damn determined. I'm not going to let the same things happen here. that are happening other places. So, yeah, it's, um, I just wish... I wish more Canadians could see it. Then they would appreciate this this country. It is really something that has to be has to be experienced, I think, yeah. firsthand, um, which is I think why travel is so important. I mean, it's not just traveling to the you know the resorts and, and other spots of the world that are, oh, that are God, easy, no. but it, there's a real value in uh, in, in going to places that um, that are struggling, and if for no other reason than to have that sort of sense of appreciation of how oh. how lucky we are in Canada. And there are those who who want to say that we're not lucky. We are, we are, and it, this is something worth fighting for so when i go to places like congo or or even afghanistan or haiti or places and people say there's something wrong with canada yes canada we can always make it better but man if you destroy it if you destroy it you can't rebuild People think, oh, it just get, you you lose it. That's the the history around the world, and and those who would preach um, 
and dismantling and taking things apart. Um, oh, it's never ended up. It's never ended up better. I mean, you can you can you know uh, talk about change. Yes, we need to update things. We do need to make things. There are ways we can make it better, but be careful. Be careful of those who would destroy things, who would dismantle things, who would, um, and, and there's a reason why, why countries like Canada challenge other people around the world, because we challenge them to be better. We're not perfect. And that's one of my other favorite sayings, perfection is the enemy of the good. And there's people saying, uh, Canada's not perfect, therefore it's no good. No, 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 no. Canada's not perfect, so we need to make it better. But if you, if you, you know, decide to, because it's not perfect, it's not good enough to protect, then we're all in a world of hurt. Then we're all going to be struggling. God, I think, I do wish more people saw the rest of the world. I do. And because I think the gratitude, appreciation for for what we have, I think it's so important. So, and I, I think there are people that would want to convince people other up, otherwise. So, I, uh, I interviewed um, a gentleman named Shwai Brahim, who is an Afghan living in Toronto now. It's fascinating, uh, fascinating fella, and and he raised this issue, Karen, um, which I I think is so important. Is he sort of compared? You know, any kind of democracy or Canada to to a pane of glass and that people think that it's just it's going to be resilient. It's, it's always going to be like that. But once it breaks, putting it back together is almost impossible. So you have to do everything you can to protect it, mm. to make it resilient, to make sure it doesn't break. And as you said, we're not talking about perfection here. Nothing's perfect. Trying to be better every day is the goal. Um, and and all, all, it's always good to recognize how fortunate we are. You, if you don't feel like like you're fortunate, you, there might be some people who have got obviously are going to have worse uh, worse lives than others. That's just the reality. But in the aggregate, I think we are very fortunate here in Canada, and it all starts with kind of recognizing how lucky we are. No, I, I, that, and that's absolute. And thank you for sharing that. You're right. Democracy is like a pane of glass. Yeah, you, it, it'll just be taken apart piece by piece by piece, and uh, and then we'll end up. It, we've seen it happen in in other countries around the world. We we have those examples right. of how fragile it actually is. Yeah. So um, you know that's that's why I I got involved in politics in the in the first place. I didn't like seeing some of the. Um, the direction that the government was taken, and um, and I thought that they were threats to democracy. I thought they were a threat to our country and everything that we stood for. And I thought, okay, I'm I'm just not going to be able to to stand by. I, this is there is something there is work that needs to be done here. So. Uh, it's funny though people and now I'm back so I was an MP for almost six years and now I'm back as an MPP and people say you must love politics mm. I hate politics mm. I hate it it's horrible I was gonna it, actually had that, it's horrible I had that written down as a question do you consider yourself a politician a political person like how no. how would you classify yourself you had this great military career and I mean we're jumping back and forth here and that's that's all that's all good and then you make the decision to go into the politics you end up in the house of commons and then you retire from politics or you retire from from that role and then you throw yourself back into it so i was thinking about this last night i mean is is karen classify herself or are you a politician or are you a political person like how how do you see this i'm a servant i am one who has been given gifts at, and I want to make sure that other people have the same kind of opportunities that I did. What they do with them is, is, is up to them. I am a student of history. I am a student of military history. And I see the intersections between military and political. 
I see how strongly and I see how one can manipulate the other. And when I, you know, when I first got involved in politics, because I was not happy with I saw what I saw Mr. Harper doing. I didn't like him ignoring the with the laws that came out of the Supreme Court. I don't think that's right. Democracy depends upon on having the three different pillars, and they need to operate independently. And Canada has become a wonderful country because of that. But when you start chipping away at the judi judiciary and you start insulting Supreme Court judges, like you only have to look down south of here to know where that leads, right? To insurrection and to threats to our democracy. So when he started doing that of going, okay, no, that's not the Canada I, I believe in. And I want a Canada with a strong social safety net that looks after each other and, and yet stands up for what's right. And, um, and I think that he, has a, he had a very different vision of the world and countries than I do. So I just couldn't not do something. And it's the same now when I became an MPP. Who, no, nobody expected our local MPP here to resign. That was not any, anybody any respected. She was a cabinet minister. But then when she resigned, I had been such a vocal critic of Mr. Ford and what he is doing that I, well, it's either uh, shut up or step up. Mm. That was uh, like, uh, I, the door opened. Oh, crap. <laughs> crap. The door opened. And not being one to close doors. Oh, man. And, and so I, I know that I would be the, the only one that ha would have a chance to defeat the conservative candidate because you have to, to win in this riding, you have to at least be able to attract some conservative vote, people who would normally vote conservative. And I, I'm, and I think, I got to try and convince. I think more conservatives are seeing now, are seeing it now, in that these conservatives are not their conservatives. They're not the same. And, but if you look at the Republicans in the United States, they haven't quite figured it out yet either, right? But more Canadian conservatives are figuring it out that they've just stolen the name. And um, so I need to attract at least some of those conservatives, but uh, they know me. They know that I've looked after everybody. I don't care what your political ideology is. I don't care who you vote for. If you need help, I'm going to help you, right? That's, that's my job. My job is to come and help people and be there for them, right? So, uh, you know, it, I had enough people in, in the conservative circles who, who said to me, <sighs> Why do you have to be a liberal? <laughs> <laughs> but it's, I'm going to be honest with you. For me, I'm not a liberal. Like I am in that, to me, the political party, for some people, the political party is what matters. It's not me. But for me right now, the liberal party most represented my beliefs. But um, somebody said... Um, when they were talking about political parties, it's not like a marriage. It's like public transit. You're not stuck with them for the rest of your life. You're actually trying to get something that gets you as close to where you're going as possible. Yeah. Okay? So uh, I'm, I'm not a big believer in uh, strengthening um, political parties. And um, I'm a big a defender. I do believe we need electoral reform. Some of those models that come forward strengthen political parties, and I don't want that. I want to make more room for independents like me. So people that, that just want to serve their community. That's, that's what I think we need in politics is more independence. I love the, I love the public transport uh, analogy <laughs> because I find myself these days, if any, and I don't think I have too many people these days sort of asking, you know, what party you align to. But if someone were to, it'd be, well, you, let's talk about an issue. If you're going to get into the political game, I suppose you, this is just our, our reality. So I, I think, I think independence is, uh, would be, would be fantastic. You were, you retired from the military and you continued to serve. And I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, this is about service. Uh, and so you decided to continue to serve 
we talked about your first foray was supporting, I think, David Pratt's campaign. Yeah, yeah. Um, so what really sort of got the, the was it the, what you talked about, about the, the, the government that was in place, their actions that really stoked yeah. the fire to get you going? You didn't get elected straight away. No. So you had a couple of... I did. And, and how, was, how was that road to getting to the House of Commons for you? Like what? What is that? What did that look like? And what were some of the the lessons that you learned about politics in your road to election? Yeah. Well, so I volunteered for the first time in two thousand and eight um, in Ottawa, Western PM, actually. Um, and uh, David Pratt was running, and and I what I met was a fantastic group of people. Again, comes back to people, just magnificent, wonderful, community-minded servants, people that were involved in politics because they wanted to make people's lives better. And I thought, holy cow, you know, and right after this group of people, and I, we, we, I still meet them like once a month now, that same group of people, girls, we, we all get together and they're still doing it. And I thought, and when I was working on that campaign, there was a lady, and what's her name? Helen. She would come in twice a week to make phone calls from the campaign office. She was 93 years old. I said to myself, that's what I want to be when I'm 93. And she had to take public transit. Mm. would get up in the morning, get on the bus, come to the campaign office and make phone calls because she wanted life to be better for people. I thought, okay, there you go. There's an example. And this whole, this group of people, and, and then again, a door opened. There was the candidate in, in uh, at the time it was called, uh, liberal candidate Carlton Mississippi Mills was the, the riding where I live. And um, he decided he had run in the lot in this 2008 election, and he decided he wasn't going to want run in the next one. So there was a vacancy. So all my friends said, "Oh, you need to do this. You need to do this." And so I kind of I went to a, a fundraising event, and all wandering around, I heard twenty times. You'd be perfect. You'd be perfect. You'd be perfect. I thought I kind of looked up to the sky and I said, okay, I get it. I'm supposed to do this. So, um, and, and, and I did. And again, it was about um, building a team. You don't do it on your own. You have to build a team. And so I ran in 2010 to become the liberal candidate here. Um, in uh, it was called Carlton Mississippi Mills at the time, and the election was in 2011, and I lost by 22,000 votes. I mean, that was that was hard. I I knew it was going to be tough, but 22,000 votes was a lot. But that was the the Harper um, kind of you know um, wave kind of thing. How? I mean, you we just sort of walked through your 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 career really successful. I mean, was that the first sort of big failure? Um, and, and how do you deal with that? Because I, I think that's always really important. I mean, we we tend to highlight our successes in life, um, but I think we learn a little, so much from our failures. You know what I learned? And, and this has helped me help a lot of other people. It's funny. And I think it's important, especially, and it's the same on a deployment too, Um but I didn't quite understand it at the time. So when you're in a campaign, you are living on adrenaline. When you're on a deployment, you are living on adrenaline. Adrenaline, 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 adrenaline to go, 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 go. When it stops and that adrenaline stops flowing in your body, you've become dependent upon it. You are chemically dependent upon this adrenaline. And then we quit. You, your team, everybody involved. Everybody. Right. Um, it, it's really very, it, and until you realize, and I've been able to tell people that, and I think after that first loss, in that I think I wasn't really expecting to win. I was, you know, being, I knew it was going to be a tough one mm. because it had been a conservative riding for so long. 
Um, so there was a part of me that was not like a hundred percent convinced I was going to win. So, um, but it, it really, it really took the wind out of my sails for a, for a good, um, a, a good six months. I think it took me to get back to equilibrium and kind of, but I felt awful. Like I was dealing with depression. Really? I think, look, I never called it that back then. But that's definitely what it was, mm. you know. So, uh, and I and I think and I can explain it to people now about the chemical dependency of of the adrenaline. And uh, so uh, that it took me a while, but then I knew we had to prepare for the next election, and I knew there was a potential uh, that the next election would be easier because boundaries of these ridings were being redrawn because the suburban part of the riding was growing so quickly, which is where more liberal votes are in the right. suburban part of the riding, that actually uh, we would stand a chance. And so I had to build a team. And I had to inspire them and I had to just keep going and be out there and be involved and, and, uh, actually make some money. So, <laughs> so I, I mean, I went, uh, I went and, uh, started doing mediation work cause I'd gone to school, um, doing mediation and, um, that, that was, that was good for me. I needed something else to do where I could make a difference. And that's, that's where I did that work. And I think that healing. So going, going through that helped me actually help other people who were going to go, going through the same thing. And once I explained to them, it's results of a chemical dependency. It, it, it's normal. You're, you're, you're just don't, don't be so hard on yourself. It's not your fault. This is this you're in withdrawal. And right. that's what withdrawal feels like. Right. And I've helped a lot of people that way. But I had to go through it first. And you just, you sort of mentioned on the, uh, on, on the finance side. I mean, I, I don't really know much about the, the, the financial, the financial contributions, the, the financial burden that if you're if you're in this particular realm i mean what what is the expectation on a canadian politician federal provincial uh, what's that financial burden look like well it's not um it's generally not that great except the except for if you're going to do this right you have to give up working for a while right that's where the burden comes from not not from the not from the because the 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 fundraising system is actually in Canada about uh, as about as fair as it's going to be, really is. Okay. Um, in that the vast majority of your money will will come from donors. It has to. The rules say it has to. You're only allowed to give your own personal uh, donation, uh, and in some, you can give a little bit more, but it's not an exorbitant amount of money. It's not like in the states where you can give yourself millions of dollars. You can't here. Thank goodness. Mm -hmm. uh, but in order to do this right, you have to give up. You, I, I, there's no way I could have done this and worked full time. I just couldn't have. So I need. I needed to work to, in order to to actually give me the freedom to do what I wanted to do. So and it was great. The the mediation work I did was was uh, wonderful and that just set me up on on another path and gave me a whole other set toolkit of skills right and 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 again it was a door that opened okay go through back, go ha go have a look so um and and so that was um and so I practiced mediation between the 2011 election for about three, 2010 to 2013. And then, um, then I, uh, I, uh, kind of, I had to, I had to put it aside because then listening to my heart, <laughs> my heart told me I needed to run in the leadership a uh, liberal party leadership race. That was going to be my next question is yep, how, how is a nas national leadership race different from uh, and running to be the MP of yeah. a riding? Well, my heart said you needed to do this because the liberals have a, have a, a habit 
of infighting and and um, kind of hurting each other so that the conservatives can get the upper hand. And I didn't want to see that to happen again. And I thought, no, I could go and do this. My brain says, you're nuts. My heart <laughs> said, you need to do it. Uh, otherwise, we'll end up with Stephen Harper for life. And I kind of went, okay, all right. I'll, <sighs> yeah, okay, I can do this. Sure, I can. So I, I went and, and ran in the liberal leadership race, and I tried to set a good example of how this should be done and how you can disagree with them, with your other candidates, without making it personal. And at that time, I was running, I mean, Justin Trudeau ended up winning. Um, and at the time, I just... Um, I wanted to set an example and other people were attacking him because of his family history and that it's silver spoon and all that other. And I took them aside and I said, stop it. You don't want me as an enemy. Trust me, you don't. You can challenge him on every single one of his, whatever you, you have policies, you go for it. No more personal attacks. That's, that's, this has got to, this has got to be done right. And so, it, and I think we did that whole leadership race and it turned out really well, you know, I, and um, I thought that um, being a woman veteran would make me a little less vulnerable to some of the kind of attacks we see happening today. And I think, um, and I still believe that to be true, um, because I think when you're a veteran, and that's what hurts me when I see some of, some veterans using um uh, are that title um, to actually um, promote ideas that are contrary to democracy, contrary to what we stand for. Um, but I think people look at you, you've, you're already a step up on, on the trust in that you've already earned some of that. You've earned the opportunity of the benefit of the doubt, right? And I think um, so... And so it was, what an, what an experience it was. And I mean, we were on a, we didn't want to go into debt, right? We were on a, right. you can't. And so there was no way we were making, uh, we were getting the kind of donations that other candidates were getting. But we were at, we were at every single debate and we did a good job and we got some good ideas out there. And we ended up with a, a race where uh, liberals were united. So I was happy, but again, the same adrenaline crash, the right. same adrenaline, but this time I knew what it was. This time I knew what it was. Mm. So that made it easier. What I love about hearing you or watching you tell that story is you can see how you're having that sort of self-talk about this is going to be really hard. I'm I'm not sure how much I really want to do this. You said my head is telling me, but I know it's the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. I think as many people have said before, right, that's the, you know, whether you define it as courage, uh, moral courage, however it is, you know, you, you see something's going to be difficult. You know, it's going to have a level of, uh, of burden, emotional, mental burden, whatever it might be, it could be reputational burden, uh, but it's the right thing to do. So you step into it anyways. Mm -hmm. And just seeing you tell that, I said, yep, I, I've experienced that before. It's very, uh, it's difficult. And I think it's probably one of the things that maybe turn people away from leading is because it's, it's not easy. I fail to be able to come up with an example of something really meaningful, uh, that has been created or advanced that hasn't required leadership. Right. Or sacrifice. Yeah, or sacrifice. Yeah. You spent your time as an MP, um, and then you threw your head back in the ring, and, and you're now in uh, our MPP here in Canada, which mm -hmm. is wonderful. What's your hope, hope for the future? What would you? What are some of the things you you would like to see? I mean, because you continue to serve, mm -hmm. you continue to, you know, put in your time and your effort, and uh, you know, there's there's no doubt. I mean, your your schedule is um, not to overstate it, but it's punishing. I mean, may, maybe giving people a bit of a sense. That's a perhaps it's a good way to start answering this question. Is you know, what does your week look like? Oh, and I'm trying to keep it under control. <laughs> <laughs> so I, 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 as an MP, I completely failed keeping under control. Completely failed. 
And there were some t- at times during my MP days that I lost my morning routine. Right. And 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 I gave up uh, working out first thing in the morning. They're just what I could either work out or I could sleep, but I couldn't do both. And uh, that was a mistake. I, it, I'll tell you honestly, that was a mistake. I should have given up on sleep. But anyway, but I... I learned, though, through when I was an MP and working 70 hours a week, that I, at the end, I, I could say no. Mm. I, I, needed, I needed to say no. And that's the lesson I'm telling some of my newer MPs or MPPs who, who I chat to, reach out to me. I said, you need to say no. You need to say no if you're going to do this job. So... I'm not doing, but I kind of, kind of save up my energy. I know for the next, the the next month in the run up to Christmas, it's going to be, it is going to be absolutely punishing because uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, we're in the legislature and we can be there till midnight. Starts at nine o'clock in the morning on Monday and 10 o'clock every other day. But the problem is, yes, that's something we have to do. That's not where I get my my joy. Mm. It's to me, especially in a legislature where there's a supermajority, there's nothing, and they don't listen to what you say, nothing of any consequence happens in the legislature. They have they will bully through whatever legislation they want. Uh, but I have to be there. But then where I get my joy is when I'm in the riding. And so like this morning, today, and uh, I'll be here in, in Canada now, Canada Carlton, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So today wasn't bad. And we started at nine with, uh, I, I get up every morning, do my, my trying to, uh, but I couldn't even force myself to go out for a walk this morning. I usually I just got on the treadmill. Usually I go outside, it's better, but I just couldn't do it this morning. And and then um, I'm there's always email and then there's Zoom calls and there's all kinds of calls we do. And then this afternoon, but this afternoon is going to be fun later on. I'm going out to the defrim bunker to make an announcement, which is fun. Then I'm going out to a couple of bazaars which is fun. People are always happy to see you. Then I'm going to go prepare our Christmas, our float for the Christmas parade, which is also fun. Mm. Tomorrow is uh, Christmas parades and uh, bazaars. And uh, and that starts at, that'll start around eight in the morning. And then I have uh, a fundraising spaghetti dinner from one of the local cadet corps. So I'll be going there in the evening. And so that'll end probably about nine. And then uh, Sunday is much the same. Sundays, Sundays I like to normally take it easier, but uh, there's um, the Pearly veterans are coming out to uh, oh, great. the Legion out in Constance Bay. And I always go out there for that. And it's always, it just brings me so much joy. And they're always so happy to, to see us there. So, and that's tomorrow. And then I have a, a tree lighting and an, another bazaar. And, and then, uh, then I'll go back to Toronto late Sunday night. Like the flights, I think is at 1030, mm. 10 o'clock maybe. It almost sounds like your, your time in the riding fills your bucket and then you, that's you use that energy throughout that's, the week. That then, is exactly right. Yeah. That's exactly what it is. And I just... And um, so during the week, I think it's really challenging uh, because um, you kind of see what's going on and you're really kind of powerless and I hate that. So every now and then I just poke the bear because it's fun and then they get mad at me and I'm, I'm, I'm glad and then I win. So anyway. Well, it's kind of like your experience as a CEO and how you said that, you know, once you leave that, that level, it gets harder and harder to stay connected to, to that. Right. I mean, this is, this is why you're doing this and coming back is whether it's filling the bucket or reminding you, you know, why you're stepping into the legislature is important. And that's why COVID was so hard on people like me. Right. People that want to be connected with people who have, and and not being able to get that, you know, people fill me up normally. There's some that drag me down, <laughs> but the vast majority, vast majority fill me up. 
and um and that's where i get that that reinvigoration you know that 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 power that passion comes back alive and covid was hard because that took that away from and i think a lot of people like me who felt exactly the same way so yeah i come back here to connect with people because it's the people that matter to me so um i i and that's what that's it's the people that keep me going Mm. not the politics oh god so what what are your hopes for the future then whether it be as your your current role as MPP or, you know, Canada writ large, kind of an open question. I, oh, it's, um, I hope we don't make a bad decision. And just because we're angry and disappointed, uh, I, I hope people see that, yes, things are tough right now, uh, but they're tough all over the world, all over the world. I mean, when we look at our fiscal shape here in Canada, we're like the second hot best in the G7. Other countries like us, we're actually in good shape. So could you imagine how other countries are? They're struggling. And I think there are, there are malevolent forces that will want to take control of that, take advantage of that. And uh, I, I, I will work hard to try and do what I can do to make sure that doesn't happen. Um, and... So for me, again, it comes down to people and people need to believe that there's a potential for a future. And here in Ontario, it's, it's really health care. Um, that's the number one issue at the door. People not having a family doctor, not being able to get primary care, not being able to get specialist care, um, the uh, failings in long-term care. Um, so those things, I think, if we can't have a, a, a healthcare system that actually can help people. Uh, that's what I, I, I really want to work on. That's, and I know that if I do that, that will, this will be good for my people, for my riding too. They, they feel that way. They feel that way. And um, so that's one. And the other one is affordable housing. So, um, I want people to believe that the young people to believe that they can afford, they will be able to afford a house. And, and, uh, and right now I think that's at risk. And I don't know how all this came to be. I have my suspicions, but um, I, I think there's those of us who are in a good place and who do have resources um, we have to be willing to share some of that those advantages we've had and and so that young people in this country can actually have a home and we don't have to go we don't have to go full and I don't think most young people would want to a little house with a picket fence we just need affordable uh, apartments affordable condos where people can because most people in Europe don't live in large sprawling neighborhoods they lo- live in denser cities and towns i think th- and and they make those cities and towns very livable and i think that's the future we should be we should be aiming for where people can afford a home can believe that there is a, a good future and that they'll be looked after karen it's been so nice to spend time with you today and uh, and get your uh get your perspective on a number of issues and to, to hear your, your life of service. And, and the, the last question I always ask all the guests is if you have any recommendations for the listener that could uh, educate, entertain, or elevate. I would say the, the, um, the book that I've probably gifted the most often um, is uh, Stephen Covey's The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And uh, I'm... I like to go out for breakfast, so I'm a breakfast person. So I would say the Heart and Soul Cafe in Dunrobin, Ontario, and I would say the Constance Lake Lodge. Both serve up wonderful breakfasts, and uh, you'll find me at one place or the other regularly on a weekend. Fantastic. Karen, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it and, uh, and being a, a part of the Northern Sentinels podcast. It's been an absolute pleasure. Please keep doing what you're doing, you know, because I think it's important when people have a chance to tell their stories. And um, yeah, 
it's uh there's so much there's so much good news out there right but the the stories don't get told so i appreciate the work you do to tell those good stories well thank you so much and thank you for being a part of it You can find information in the show notes on Karen's military career, political campaigns and achievements, and her reading and breakfast recommendations. Thanks for listening to the NSP, and goodbye until next time.